Only those who still have hope can benefit from tears. When they finish, they feel better. But to those without hope, like Homer, whose anguish is basic and permanent, no good comes from crying. Nothing changes for them. They usually know this, but still can't help crying. Well, it's a holiday in Cambodia, where people dress in black. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Better Than Food Book Reviews. I'm your pretentious host, Clifford Lee Sargent, and I have not gotten, like, any sleep whatsoever. And it is very, very hot outside, but that's okay. I'm not going to complain. Life's just great. Life's just cheery. Thought I would just mix it up a little bit today. Hope you guys are doing really well. Hello, Zinfandel. Yeah. Today, today is Nathaniel West's Day of the Locust. I was going to wait a little bit to review it, but it's just too good. It's just too good. Had to get it out today. Had to get it out. If any of you guys out there have not checked out What the Fuck with Mark Marin, which is a podcast, Mark Marin, the stand-up comedian here based out of Los Angeles, uh, you ought to do it. It's great. Highly recommend it. Um, I actually got this tip from an episode where he interviewed Crispin Glover a few months back. And uh, I'm a fan of Crispin, and I like what he does, and they were talking about this book, hmm. which takes place in uh, early Hollywood, studio era Hollywood, or maybe like, well, like the 30s. Um, my girlfriend listened to the interview. She made me listen to it, picked up the book. We both read it. It's fucking amazing. Uh, it took a whole two days. It's a very quick read. It's lightning fast. And it's a nice tale of madness and broken dreams in Tinseltown. I know. Boldly original. But well, probably was at the time. Oh, God, yes. You like my film noir setup here? Uh... I mean, anybody who's seen that double, double Indemnity? I think that one's my favorite film noir. That's like the standard, the classic, other than Citizen Kane. And then, uh... Mm, oh, fuck, that's good. That's really good. Oh, man. 2014, Varon, from Sonoma County here in California. It's a red Zinfandel. Really, really rich and delicious. Fruit everywhere. Everywhere. Um, what was I talking about? Oh yeah, film noir. Um, I saw another one with Bogey recently. I can't remember. There's always Casablanca, of course. It's like one of the best, but there was a, there was one. Um, I can't remember the name of it. I'll have to, I'll have to post uh, something about it on Twitter. I remember I saw this, uh, this, uh, Humphrey Bogart film noir, which was like, in an, in an unhappy place, no, that sounds ridiculous, in a something, it was great, it was a tale of a screenwriter, you know, in Hollywood, same era as this, and uh, black and white, and there's this whole, um, you know, this impossible, this relationship that is just turning out, you're proving to be impossible because of all the suspicion between the two of them, it's magnificent, uh, great, great classic film noir, all, um, in a lonely place, what the fuck is it in with it, let me look it up really quick. Humphrey Bogart in you no know, that's what it's called yeah in a in a lonely place in a lonely, in a lonely place 1950 yeah I saw that at the Cine family not too long ago that one's incredible because that is Nicholas Ray too and that also has uh, Gloria Graham who Nicholas Ray was seeing but Gloria Graham. Uh, was caught by Nick Ray uh, fucking his son, who was like th like 13 or something at the time, or something like really young. It was this huge scandal. It's totally fucked up. Anyways, more about Hollywood scandal. Uh, great film, though. Great film. Nicholas Ray, amazing director. Gloria Graham even does a great job, and Bogey, right, doesn't get better. Anyways, that's for all you guys who have been complaining about no more film reviews, but I don't... 
We're going to see what happens with that. My time, I have none. I have no time. There is no time. Never was. Uh, anyways. So Day of the Locust concerns a painter who is working as an artist in Hollywood, um, doing these concept designs. But what he's actually doing in his own personal life is gathering all of these ideas to paint this apocalyptic mural, this apocalyptic painting, uh, which he is going to refer to as the burning of Los Angeles, which is going to depict all of those who, in his own words, uh, have come to California to die. This is the 30s. Great way of setting up the character here. During the, his last year in art school, he had begun to think that he might give up painting completely. The pleasures he received from the problems of composition and color had decreased as his facility had increased, and he had realized that he was going the way of his classmates towards illustration or mere handsomeness. Mediocrity. When the Hollywood job had come along, he had grabbed it despite the arguments of his men's who were certain that he was setting, selling out and would never paint again. Just insert like painting with like, you know, film or music and basically you have anybody who comes to California at all to work in the creative business, you know. And this is right in the beginning when they're actually describing the people that he's seeing around the lot and in West Hollywood and around the studio. And uh, he left the car at Vine Street. The street he took the streetcar. Uh, as he walked along, he examined the evening crowd. A great many of the people wore sports clothes, which were not really sports clothes. Their sweaters, knickers, slacks, blue flannel jackets with brass buttons were fancy dress. The fat lady, the fat lady in the yachting cap was going shopping, not boating. The man in the Norfolk jacket and the Tyrolean hat was returning, not from a mountain, but an insurance office. And the girl in slacks and sneaks with a bandana around her head had just left the switchboard, not a tennis court. Scattered among these masquerades were people of a different type. Their clothing was somber and badly cut, bought from mail order houses. While the others moved rapidly, darting into stores and cocktail bars, they loitered on the corners or stood with their backs to the shop windows and stared at everyone who passed. When their stare was returned, their eyes filled with hatred. At this time, Todd knew very little about them except that they had come to California to die. Mm. And that is the thread line through which we enter Todd's world and we see the characters through Todd's eyes. It's not a great narrative structure. It's actually kind of jumbled and sort of like falls apart in certain places, but then it kind of like picks back up when you get to the end as this whole cohesive uh, vision of hatred and anguish, you know, of Hollywood at the time. It's great for that, but that's why you ought to read it. And not, you know, it's not... It doesn't really flow. It's kind of... Mm, there were a couple of mistakes that I made regarding which character was which and who was who in their relationship because it gets a little bit tangled in there. may have been intentional, I gather probably not, but we'll see. A lot of the book is dialogue driven and the best dialogue is given to Todd's neighbor, this dwarf, who is this furious, drunken, slovenly, hate-filled little man. Todd initially meets him when he spots like this, what looks like a... Like a um, a bunch of laundry on somebody's doorstep, but it turns out that it's like this overcoat and he's sleeping under it, and Todd wakes him up and says, hey, are you all right? And he just gets up and he starts banging on the door, the door, you know, whose step he's under, and he just starts screaming, you bitch, give me back my clothes! Give me back my clothes! And this woman opens the door and they have this whole what have you. It's very, very funny. Um, so they become friends, and then Todd falls in love with his other neighbor, who is this poor woman who lives with her absolutely completely mentally unstable father, and who possesses these sickeningly saccharine, delusional fantasies of becoming a star. Of course, for whatever reason, possibly his own masochism, Todd falls in love with her. Her name is Faye. She claims that she wants to be nothing but a star. She wants nothing else in the world. If she doesn't get it, she'll kill herself. And she's not afraid to mention it in conversation as a non sequitur. On the surface, she seems to be this delusional kid, but underneath, she's this incredibly jaded, sinister, evil bitch. There's one particularly horrifying scene in a bar where Faye is force-feeding Todd bourbon after accusing him of being better than her because he's not acting like a drunk and getting fucked up like the rest of them. Todd later on envisions a very detailed method on how to rape her. 
several times, which keeps getting interrupted by, you know, kind of like in comical ways before you can visualize the climax, so to speak. It's very, very dark material. Dark material, and of course the irony is that this is supposed to be, you know, like the land of sun and honey, or, you know, like just the most beautiful place, whatever, you know, so on and so forth, we've all heard it, Disneyland. Um, but, you know, even the architecture here begins to take on that tone of kind of like sick, sad, debilitating desperation. On the corner of La Puerta Road was a miniature Rhine castle with tar paper turrets pierced for archers, next to a little highly colored shack with domes and minarets out of the Arabian Nights. Again, he was charitable. Both houses were comic, but he didn't laugh. Their desire to startle was so eager and guileless. It is hard to not... It is hard to laugh at the need for beauty and romance, no matter how tasteless, even horrible, the results of that need are. But it is easy to sigh. Fewer things are sadder than the truly monstrous. Cartoonish mixed material alien looking buildings uh, shaped like the products they're selling soon to be abandoned, demolished, or re-envisioned as a whole new other horrible entity selling this whole new other product, you know. Todd is painting this picture of Hollywood. That's what he does. He's a painter. He's painting it for us and making these introductions and insights. Long time before Less Than Zero, but obviously, you know. This one is the beginning. To the best of my knowledge. It's a nihilistic pulp noir-esque story about the sullen anguish that comes with the great deal of dashed expectations. All their lives they had slaved at some kind of dull, heavy labor behind desks and counters in the fields and at tedious mas machines of all sorts, saving their pennies and dreaming of the leisure that would be theirs when they had had enough. Finally, that day came. They could draw a weekly income of 10 or 15 dollars, where else should they go but California, the land of sunshine and oranges? Once there, they discover that sunshine isn't enough. They get tired of oranges, even of avocado pears and passion fruit. Nothing happens. They don't know what to do with their time. They haven't the mental equipment for leisure. The money nor the physical equipment for pleasure. Did they slave so long just to go to an occasional Iowa picnic? What else is there? They watch the waves come in at Venice. There wasn't any ocean where most of them came from. But after you've seen one wave, you've seen them all. The same is true of the airplanes at Glendale. If only a plane would crash once in a while so they could watch the passengers be consumed in a holocaust of flame, as the newspapers put it. But the planes never crash. Their boredom comes, their boredom becomes more and more terrible. They realize they've been tricked and burned with resentment. Every day of their lives, they read the newspapers and went to the movies. Both fed them on lynching, murder, sex crimes, explosions, wrecks, love nests, fires, miracles, revolutions, war. This daily diet made sophisticates of them. The sun is a joke. Oranges can't titillate their jaded palates. Nothing can ever be violent enough to make taut their slack minds and bodies. They have been cheated and betrayed. They have slaved and saved for nothing. You could lift that right out of there and plant it right now. 2016, how far have we come? Oh, I don't know. Who's retiring at 65 and do what are they doing? Something similar. And more what? What happens when you retire? I'll tell you what happens. You die. I love that whole passage and I think it's true for everyone in some sense, at least in periods, you know? Where you come to a place like this to achieve things like that and realize that even if your idea was good, even if it was solid, in the realm and scheme of things, it doesn't really mean jack shit. It's not really up to you, right? So after this fantastically gruesome cockfight, which Todd witnesses, which I'm not gonna read aloud because I wanna save at least some of you know, the good stuff for the book, uh, which harkens back to the line, nothing can ever be violent for them, we're finally thrown into the chaos of the final and most notorious scene of the whole novel, which is actually that last passage, passage that I read that, that was like right in the culmination of this thing. It's kind of like in the middle of Hollywood when these stars are like, there's this whole event and all these crowds are coming to see the stars, right? You know, it's at this premiere or something where 
The crowds are so enormous they're beginning to tear everything apart, quite literally. They're all like these old pederasts raping little girls in the crowd because they're so bunched in together and they can get away with it. People essentially ripping each other apart and killing one another. And then suddenly the entire fiasco begins to resemble the metaphor that Todd was going to use for you know, his painting in the first place. It literally begins to look like his painting. The burning of Los Angeles. The whole immolation of all the sickness and rage and misery and disillusionment and pain that makes up the culture that inhabits this city. Like Less Than Zero, like Maps of the Stars, like The Player, whatever you want. Or any Hollywood film discussing the disenchantment with the whole machine, the whole fucked up mechanism. The sick realization that this thing is so fucked up and rotten from the inside, you better turn around and run immediately if you want any shred of your humanity left intact before it is raped, beaten out of you, and publicly castrated and humiliated. What year was this written in? Drum roll please. 1939. The 30s. Nathaniel West was killed a year after this book's publication. He ran a red light in the town in California when he was uh, driving with his wife coming back from a hunting trip in Mexico. Maybe he did find some peace after all. If he was on vacation from this place he loathed so much with someone whom hopefully he had enough soul left to love. At the same time, 37 is pretty damn young. For all you fans of Death Grips, there is a film adaptation of this uh, from 74 with Donald Sutherland and Karen Black, bottomless pit, who was the actress interviewed by Zach Hill for the promotional thing. Uh, the legend continues. She is so fucking aggravating as Faye in that film, which is, you know, to say maybe she does a very, very good job, but she is so aggravating I had to turn it off halfway through. I mean, she is absolutely nauseating. Uh, which is, you know, again, either great or, or terrible, I can't tell. The film also looks like it was filmed from, like, the bottom of your great-grandmother's disgusting brown glass from the 70s. Um, I can't highly recommend it, but it's there if you want to check it out. Um, so, that's it for today. Next week, I'm going to review, oh yeah, Kenneth Anger's Hollywood Babylon, keeping in this theme, two-part series. Kenneth Anger's Hollywood Babylon. Kenneth Anger is an experimental film director uh, who was legendary, but was a child star in Hollywood. Uh, one of the most interesting characters of all time, hands down. Hollywood Babylon is, in his own words, the legendary underground classic of Hollywood's darkest and best kept secrets. So there's going to be plenty of great stuff next week. If you're interested in this classic Hollywood darkness, you know, that I certainly am. All right, Day of the Locust, Nathaniel West. I hope you guys are doing very well. I will talk to you guys next week. Um, go and tell your mom life is far too short to read bullshit. Please subscribe and donate on Patreon. Follow me on Twitter for updates. Talk to you soon. Have a great day. Stay cool. Ciao.